Um, we, I kind of made it an executive decision to start without our other speaker for the moment, and we'll have uh, Lindsay begin with her presentation, and then Dina Shahid hopefully will join us um, very, very shortly, and we'll be able to move into the second presentation. Okay, so Lindsay, okay. you super. Hello. Hi. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to quickly say that I think that you know in the work that we do, we use a lot of terms like informal and formal. And I think that informal means something very different uh, in Latin America than it does in the city of Cairo. So just to kind of keep this in mind as, as I'm going through my presentation, that the definition of formality does have, or the word informality does have different definitions. So maybe this is also something that we can then discuss uh, afterwards, is you know what is the terminology and what's the best way to kind of empower these neighborhoods as opposed to kind of classify them. So um, basically today, I want to continue the lecture that I gave on Friday, because I kind of see this as one continuous working session over the course of the weekend. Um, so I'm going to just briefly go over like a few key points that I mentioned uh, on Friday, just to kind of get you aware of some of the key, the key concepts. Um, so I began on Friday by discussing our approach to design and to cities and to informality. Um, and although I won't go into too much detail about this today, it's important that you realize that the contemporary city has really undergone unprecedented urbanization in recent history. Um, and as a result, we see that the city is undergoing many challenges. We have mobility <coughs> systems, there's an unequal distribution of wealth, there's um, an acute asymmetry in social, economical, and political engagements. And in many cases, we see this rapid expansion of the informal settlements. And so knowing these struggles, we really have to ask ourselves, like, what do we do with this information? We know that these informal communities challenge the capacities, the resilience, and the kind of resources of the urban footprint. But at the same time, these areas really do have um, massive potential to provide new trajectories for design. Maybe I wait. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Sorry, um, so, in our practice, we really do focus on the territory between the formal and the informal. And like I said, informal does mean something different to us in Latin America. Um, and we realize that this zone between the formal and the informal, this is where, and this area can really serve as a new point of contact for architects within the city. And as I discussed on Friday, we really try to engage with cities and these informal areas as opportunities, not really as problems to be erased. Uh, and it is this space in between that is a really unique platform for the investigation and the integration of formal and formal, where top down can meet bottom up. And this is a, a pretty wonderful image. Here you see Gustavo Dudamel. He's one of the most famous conductors in the world. He's Venezuelan, and he actually now leads the Los Angeles Film Um And this is him performing a free concert in the Barrio La Vega in Caracas. And it really was like an exceptional day. Um, and here you really do see where informal and formal can begin to come together. Top down doesn't have to just be the government. There's a lot of top actors and bottom actors, and this is a moment where both of them came together. And if you look very closely, you probably see me somewhere in the background there. Um, but it was an exceptional day and a really wonderful experience to see how we can begin to bridge these, these two. Oops. No. Here. Yeah, OK. Um, so like I said, these each come out from each other. And so for us, it's not an evolution from exclusion to inclusion. But as I said on Friday, it's really exclusion to collaboration. And this is really our starting point for, the, for design. It's the idea of the syncretic city. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but basically we define the syncretic city as one that allows oppositional ideas to coexist without the homogenizing effect of equalization. Uh, in other words, the syncretic city um, is a productive coexistence of different forces within the city where the city can actually be, be built on, in, and within the old city. And hopefully, through the projects that I show you today, you'll begin to get an idea of what it is I'm actually talking about. And so on Friday, I also discussed our Metro Cable project. 
And I'm not going to show the project again today, but just so you have an idea of what it is, uh, the Metro Cable is a multimodal mobility system, and it's also a framework for social design. And it's located in San Agustin, which is a barrio in Caracas, Venezuela. And the system basically ties uh, existing public transportation system into the community while simultaneously providing ecological, economic, and social viability into this community through a series of plug-in programs. And collectively, the Metro Cable, along with the two projects that I'm going to discuss today, one is the Centro de Sao Social Pro Musica, and the other is the Torre de B Research. Uh, these three projects collectively frame our idea of the syncretic city. <coughs> Okay, so uh, the Centro de Social, uh, the Centro de Estado Social for Musica is located in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and it's in a favela called Parasopolis. And the project basically consists of a terrace landscape, a music school, and a community center that are really conceived as one integrated building. And its introduction to the site immediately um, provides social and cultural exchange while simultaneously serving as a catalyst that encourages new uses. Um, and for this project, we worked very closely with the city, Sehavi, which is the um, Secretary of Housing, as well as with the community. And this is also another moment where we engage this top-down, bottom-up initiative. So Parasopolis is located in the southwest corner of Sao Paulo. And it's adjacent to one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city, an area called Murundi. And this area is extremely marginalized, the Parasopolis community. As you can see from this image, on one side of the fence, you have swimming pools on every balcony. And on the other side, people don't even have access to water. So here's Parasopolis. And the challenging topography of the hills and the rivers uh, that exist in this area in combination with the zoning laws that were enacted in the 1970s had really discouraged uh, legal development in this area. So because it was difficult to develop, it resulted in a boom of invasion. And this really marked the beginning of what is now Sao Paulo's second largest favela. Uh, there's approximately 80,000 people that live in Sao Paulo, uh, that live in Parasopolis, and this is an area that covers around one square kilometer. And this is an area that doesn't have adequate social infrastructure, public space, economic opportunities, or mobility. And Parasopolis is faced with many challenges, one of which is the precariousness of the new construction. Uh, as you can see from the slides, some, in, some of the homes are actually in very good building stock, but others really could fall over at any moment. Uh, there's also the challenges of accessibility, drainage, and sewage. And this issue actually becomes very evident when you look at these two slides. And these are two of the streets that actually lead into uh, our project site. Uh, and of course, there's also a serious issue of waste removal. Not being plugged into the formal waste collection system really does cause serious issues in Parasopolis. And this is both human and environmental issues. And this is actually our project site. Uh, and because there's nothing there, it's actually become a waste receptacle for the neighborhood. So I think it's important to kind of discuss what motivates us and what's kind of pushed the project forward. Um, so first, there are really three major catalysts that have led to the design proposal that we now have. And each of these are, are a serious challenge, but at the same time, they really do provide uh, a wonderful set of potentials that we want to tap into. So the first, the first uh, catalyst is the lack of public space. Uh, and you can clearly see from this image that there isn't any. Um, and um, so there are these, this uh, very limited amount of public space that exists in Parasopolis. And if you can kind of look on the screen, you see there's like one small football pitch that's on a roof. You see this? Yeah. Um, and this is a, actually an extremely amazing potential that exists within the city because although you see that there's no space, what you might not see is that inside this community, there's actually a really dynamic potential that exists. 
you know, people uh, reappropriate roofs as sports fields, they reappropriate stairs as meeting spaces, the street becomes a market. So there is this kind of ingenuity that exists within this community. <coughs> Uh, the second catalyst that we have is that there's a serious lack of social infrastructure within this favela. So despite the fact that there's a really strong cultural dynamic that really fuels life in this favela, rapid urbanization and the challenging topography have really resulted in the development of a neighborhood that doesn't have adequate social infrastructure or any physical equipment. So Parasopolis actually has a youth orchestra and it has a youth ballet, but there's no place for them within this community to actually practice. Uh, and our third catalyst that we used is the catalyst of risk. Uh, this site has actually been designated as a high risk zone due to the fact that it has a very steep slope and dangerous rapid erosion. Uh, from the top to the bottom of the site, it's actually 25 meters. Um, and this designation actually came after very heavy rainfall caused severe mudslides and flooding. And this destroyed a large part portion of homes within our site, which you can kind of clearly see here. Um, so after this heavy rainfall, the site was basically left as an inaccessible, unusable void within the city. But it's also interesting to realize that this is the only open space within an otherwise overly dense urban fabric. <coughs> so our proposal, the Centro de Estado Social for Musica, fundamentally transforms this void into a productive and dynamic space that's for the community. Uh, basically, we've introduced a terrace landscape, urban agriculture, there's a performing arts and music school, which hovers over a football pitch below, and there's also a community center at the top. Um, and the site with our project becomes accessible and it actually wants to engage all of the different actors that exist within their community. So this project consists of many components. Each addresses a different challenge. And these components actually form a toolbox. Um, and they address things such as social equity, environmental sustainability, accessibility, and social sustainability. And basically, the Centro combines the practical need to stabilize the hill with the much needed and lacking social infrastructure. So we're able to introduce education, safety, culture, and public space simultaneous with the need to retain. So this integration of physical and social infrastructure, um, oh, I'm sorry, where am I here? OK, so um, the project really began because the hill was sliding, like I said. It was a natural risk zone. So for us, in order to challenge this, uh, this topographical issue, we really had to create new section profiles in order to stop the hill and uh, prevent further erosions. So this was our, our first step. But after we did some critical analysis of the site, we really realized that the community would benefit from a socially and physically integrated infrastructure. So in addition to stabilizing the hill, the new landscape actually transforms the Grotau area into a natural, a natural arena. And this arena encourages diverse community participation. And the intervention actually opens the edges of the void and reestablishes connections with the fragmented urban fabric. Uh, and this connection is strengthened by a public elevator and bridge system that really facilitates connections and circulation throughout the site, trying to tie all of these components together. Um, so, also the building and the landscape work as one comprehensive unit that utilizes varying conditions of the wet-dry season. Um, and this project employs a combination of active and passive systems that are able to adapt to the various conditions and needs of the, of the site and the city. Uh, and these systems find their expression in the section of the building and of the terraces. And the facade is able to mediate climate conditions in a number of ways. And the terraces act as a large heat sink during the day. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the building and the landscape. Um, so for us, the, materi the materiality, the organization, and the orientation allow the building to have a really high impact at a very low cost. And I think this is something that's very important and very applicable to Cairo as well, is that in these areas, we need to be low tech, 
we need to be low cost, but we need to be high impact. And if we're able to do that, we can really ensure a long and usable lifespan of the buildings and the urban spaces that we're creating. Infrastructure and of public space, of active and passive building systems, of mobility and productivity becomes a prototype that we can utilize to address other high risk zones. And this, I think, is applicable in Sao Paulo and globally. And basically, this project really proposes that architects like, eschew their conventional role as, uh, in order to serve as an enabling connection between the opposing forces of top-down planning and bottom-up initiatives. And for us, the desire is to create a common ground where these two forces can interact. We want to really eliminate separation and generate productive interactions. So then I'll move on to our uh, second project, and it's actually the third project in this kind of trilogy uh, of projects that I've shown, and this is Torre de Vib. And Torre de Vib really represents the syncretic city within the existing city. Uh, it is the intersection of formal and informal, and in our trajectory on, on research on informality, Torre de Vib actually presents a shift from the marginalized fringes into the urban core and into an existing building within the city. So you see the building here, quite high and kind of taken apart. Uh, so basically, um, Puerto Vida, it's a building that was abandoned and that was a subsequently invaded 45-story office tower in the center of downtown Caracas, and it's now home to over 3,000 people. Um, just to give you a very brief history of how this project came to be, uh, in January of 1990, construction began on this tower, which is, was known as the Centro Financiero de Confidenza. Uh, and this was also known locally as Torre de Vida after the developer, David, Bill David Berlinburg. Um, and the building is actually located in the heart of the city's political and financial center. But in 1994, the city of Venezuela, I guess the country as a whole, was hit by a series of bank closures, and this actually crippled the economy. Um, and as a result, the building was seized, uh, and it wasn't ever completed, and it sat vacant for over 12 years, just kind of a scar in the middle of the city. But in September 17th, 2007, there were heavy rains, and a series of events actually resulted in hundreds of families kind of standing outside the lock gates of this tower, seeking refuge. So the two guards on duty opened up the gates and that began the occupation of the tower. So Tor de Vide, uh, really is an evolution in our work from this marginalized informal settlements on the fringes to the encroachment of informal settlements into the city itself and then to the occupation of a formal vertical tower within the center of the city. So as such, the tower really does present a shift. And it's a shift from the separation of informal settlements and the formal city to an informal settlement that's actually occupying a formal structure. Uh, and it's a physical combination of formal and informal. The tower represents how a neglected urban space has the transformative potential as an active and ongoing experiment. But it's really important to note that you know we don't condone or condemn the occupation of this tower. Um, it's not our work to to really like romanticize the situation or qualify it. Uh, we're not saying that all vacant buildings should be squatted. What we're really saying is that this is something that exists in the city, and it's our responsibility to read it as an existing urban condition and understand and propose new possible trajectories. Um, so today, this tower is really a, uh, a vertical village with a lot of uses. There's residential, there are micro-economies, there's sports fields. And on the screen you see one of the uh, apartments, and you can really begin to see how these spaces are set up, and how they're divided, and how they're actually occupied. Uh, and here's another apartment uh, with a very different setup. So you begin to see that within this tower, there doesn't really exist the typical, you know, everything is very unique based on needs. Um, there are also spaces that are appropriated, and here you see a shop that's in the middle, and there are also new forms of circulation that are kind of continuously made based on need. And if you see in the corner these two guys walking through this hole, this hole was intentionally made 
in order to create shortcuts through the building. Um, so it really is kind of a fluid and adapted, adaptable situation. So then I show you a movie. Double click it. Double click. New full screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is Caracas. Um, so I'm going to show you some footage of the tower. And part of our methodology within the office is to really incorporate like various forms of documentation into our research. Um, and this trailer is a really good uh, opportunity to give you an overview and to the and some insight into kind of the daily life within this tower. Um, and like I said, it's important to note though that Torre de Vide, it's really not an anomaly. Uh, it really is an evidence of the global condition of informality. The tower actually is a doppelganger. You know, it has the image of the original form of the tower but it kind of haunts the city with alternative motivations and alternative forms of organization. Uh, the tower really sets out a new agenda that's not really outside of the lines of current urbanization, but with kind of an alternative urban trajectory. And the tower presents new modes of thinking and new ways to organize spaces and buildings and systems. Uh, the tower really is a manifest and an interface between the formal and the informal. And it, for us, it is this territory between the syncretic city. So it's important to kind of understand that the tower offers us new strategies of design. It offers us new ways to look and understand and act within the city. It's almost over. You can hear some of the fun music that goes along with it. Some reggaeton, you know, to, to get you guys excited. <laughs> the baby's not really going to fall off of the tower. There's a one, a couple feet below. There's another balcony that exists, so it wasn't as dangerous as it looked. Okay. Uh, basically, we researched the tower with Shimmer, uh, the elevator company, uh, and with uh, ITA at the ETH. And through extensive documentation, we were really able to understand how this space operates. Uh, and we tried to really understand its connections and the role that it had with the neighborhood, uh, physically based on scale and occupation and various other things. And as we began to analyze, we realized that each level really gave us a view of how these different spaces and systems were organized within the tower. And of the precise relationship that the formal structure had with the informal occupation. And these little red marks indicate new walls that were made, new spaces that were occupied. Um, and it also began to give us an understanding of the, price, the precise relationship between the formal structure and the informal um, occupation and how these began to um, accommodate one another. Uh, and as we began to study the relationship between the spaces and the evolution of these spaces in the tower, we uh, were able to kind of map all these things out, where kind of new informal structures were built and how spaces have been occupied, recycled, and transformed. Uh, and this examination was, like I said, really a resistance to the romantic romanticization or the justification of this occupation. Instead, we really wanted to understand uh, and open up the possibility to rethink verticality and to rethink how it is that we could operate within the city. And, you know, it's, we tend to really only think about elevators and water systems and electrical systems when they break down. But the tower really offers us a new perspective and a new possible trajectory for thinking about how these things operate within buildings. Uh, within the tower, these systems actually already work. Uh, water and electricity and circulation are actually already provided to the inhabitants through various ad hoc systems that are really made possible due to strong community participation. But due to their informality, 
the tower does sometimes experience blackouts or waterless days. Uh, and these challenges are actually intensified by the fact that the city of Caracas doesn't actually have the ability to meet the water and electricity demands of the city itself. While I was living in Caracas, there was definitely times when we would have no electricity or days or hours of the week when they would shut water off. So the, this is really intensified within the, the tower. So because of this, we wanted to begin to research energy consumption and demand within the tower. And I think some of these um, things that we're looking at could be possible links to Cairo and possible links to how some of the buildings here are operating. Um, so the tower is actually operating at, as a 1700 watt society. And this is very, very low. I know that the city of Zurich is aiming to be a 2,000 watt society by 2050. So there actually is a low consumption within the tower itself. Um, and with this knowledge, we began to think about what, what could we research, what potentials could we begin to understand through the use of solar and, and wind energy. Um, and we realized that if we utilize the already existing community participation that exists within the tower, we can start to introduce alternative energy and mobility infrastructures. And so because of this, we developed several decentralized systems um, that would become prototypes that could be used in this tower or transited to other places. So what you see on the screen here is the wind energy system. And, um, uh, in addition to this, we've also looked at hydro storage systems and also a kind of counterweight ele elevator. So uh, there's the idea of creating kind of small scale wind turbines that we could place on the facade. This would allow us to utilize the height of the tower and also to produce supplementary energy that could significantly shave off the peak demands. And this would allow us to minimize the number of blackout days or kind of brownouts in that, that the tower is um, experiences. Uh, in addition to the wind energy system, we also thought about a pumped hydro storage system. And this would really take advantage of this community participation in order to coordinate the storage and the distribution of water. And this would also be um, coupled with uh, electricity production. And we also thought about a new elevator system. Um, and this really re envisions how traditional mobility works in a high rise building. Um, instead of uh, having an elevator that stops at every single level, we re envisioned this elevator system to actual, actually work more like public transportation and it would work on like a fixed schedule. So the, the elevator would stop at every, every five levels and there's a ramp along the outside and so you would then use that ramp to access the other levels of, of the building. Um, and this would allow us to um, really create a kind of connection at a low cost and this elevator would work as a, as a counterweight which would allow us to also move people, uh, goods, materials and wastes. Um, so this is kind of our, our vision for how the tower could possibly be. Um, all of these things I'm discussing right now are just um, kind of visions of how this tower could be transformed in the future. Um, so basically, in the combination of these de decentralized systems, we're allowed to kind of think about design and the design of cities in a new way. Uh, this, tower, this tower really allows us to think about each level as a package or a bundle, with each unit having its own unique energy and mobility demands and solutions. Um, and it utilizes the existing tower to point to new alternative modes that address the, chain, the challenges of informality, the challenges of energy, and the challenges of mobility. Uh, all of this research was accumulated into a book that we published, but we really see this as a starting point um, to begin to think about how informality can operate within the city, uh, and how design can be used to think about that. So here's kind of a, an, an end vision. This mountain that you see here is actually where our cable car project exists in the San Agustin. So the significant actually lies within the role of us um, to kind of rethink the city by building the new, all in and within the old. 
Um, the positive effect is a result of this kind of multidisciplinary approach that we have, <coughs> that reorganizes existing conditions and knowledges into useful tools and new forms of operation. Um, so to kind of bring this back to the idea of the syncretic city, um, it's kind of, this is the beginning of that. A suggestion of the productive coexistence between the formal and the informal paradigms that are conventionally seen as polar opposites. Um, and this is where we can really learn, learn from and kind of transform not only the informal part, but the formal part, how the city can kind of grow. So um, with this, I leave you uh, with an image of Cairo. Um, as we, I guess, now we'll discuss the possibility of futures for your city. So, thank you.